Okay, so you can start by just getting your body comfortable. <clears throat> Noticing if there's tension in your muscles, you can bring those to more of a relaxed state, especially as you're bringing your attention to the spirit of Jesus who's inside you, who lives inside of you, and you're bringing your attention to his spirit right now, letting that uh, awareness also relax your muscles. And slow down your breathing, just taking a nice, slow, deep breath in and out. You can keep that nice, slow breathing going throughout the whole practice, as you remember. As we're quieting down, you may notice that the distractions are becoming more active as your mind gets more quiet. So you can take this moment to just acknowledge each distraction as it's coming up. Acknowledge what it is, and you might say, I trust you with this, Jesus, or help me trust you with this, Jesus. If you'd like, you can even journal or jot down the distractions that are coming up as you release those to his trust. As you keep noticing distractions through the time, you can continue to just acknowledge them, give them to Jesus, and bring your mind back to the scriptures that we're in. And we're going to turn now to our verses. Would anyone like to read our verses for us today? Anna or anyone else like to read? Yeah. I'll read. Start with AP. Uh huh. Which version are you reading us from? Uh, I'll read from NIV. Okay. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he, taught, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Debbie, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed them. All right, we're going to um, start, like we did last time, we're going to start with putting ourselves in the story. So at this point, we're just trying to imagine that we were right there. And maybe you're one of the people in the story, or maybe you're watching the story happen. But as you do that, as you think, kind of put your mind in that spot, that imaginative spot what do you see what is it that comes to your mind as you're thinking about being right there in the situation as it unfolds you can feel free to call it out if i were watching i would be curious to see what was happening because it feels you'd be curious because it feels a little unusual yeah yeah right okay. I think it's interesting that they just leave whatever they're doing and follow Jesus. It's like these guys are fishermen by trade. It's like you would think they'd want to collect their nets up and get everything in order and you know put it in wherever they store it and just leave it laying on the beach and head off. To Jesus, it was like, wow. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, I would question it. I did question it actually. Everyone found like, why did they do that? Like. What gave them the, like, yeah, this is a smart thing to do. Let's do it. Because <laughs> if I, I'd be like, hey, whoa, whoa, come on, that's crazy. And stay here. I'm drunk. I was kind of thinking like that, too. My question is why, because I question God. <laughs> Every once in a while. And I would, I, I feel like I'm in the boat, and I'm hearing Jesus. There's two other guys in the boat, and the two other guys just get up and leave, and I'm still sitting there like, thinking about it but now it's jesus and then i think jesus real this is right in the flesh i wonder how different you know that would be but so there's a lot of doubt too who he really was you know at the same time so it's not like 
And then I think like, wow, they really had some strong faith or some people have raised them and really have not questioned that. It's like, that's what I've put every time I've ever read this. That's always the thought I have is like, that's all it took. All he had to say was come follow me and teach you a fish for people. And they were like, okay. <laughs> really? <laughs> they weren't religious people. I mean, like, they weren't at the temples working or like people. They were there to, you know, fish for people. You think they, that was like a natural thing to be in that line. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> and all of them are like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's yeah. Yeah. Well, what's a, I think you would see it as, as his magnetism, too. You know, Jesus had a. Uh, I guess I don't know how to say it, and I don't want to compare it to but you'll see preachers and stuff that just have this blind faith following them. And I don't want to put Jesus in that same place, but I think we were talking about it, Martha and I were talking about it. what do you inherently know inside that you can't put your finger on? That I, I, I can't put my finger on it, but I'm supposed to go there. I'm supposed to go that way. Yeah. And I think that's where that comes from. I find myself thinking about the hunger that must have been, or or the pain yeah. that must have been in their lives. <clears throat> it wasn't just we read it in a couple of verses, and it's like you know, Jesus walked by the follow. It could you get into their backstory. Okay. What you're referring to? What was it that was just in there that? That was just waiting. You know, maybe they didn't know they were waiting for Jesus to come by, but there was just something. And the young lady that did the preaching a few weeks back talked about how young they were. Right. Yeah. That the disciples were young. How hard is it to an influence a young person? Not to put anything against young people. <laughs> but, it, you know, again, like she said, were they hurting? Did they want love? Did they want attention? You know, the father accepted me, told them, you know, we're going to go fish. This is what you do. There is no choice. This is your life. Mm -hmm. This guy comes along and says, follow me. I'll show you something else. Oh, cool. Let's go with him. That's good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that's in modern terms, but isn't that true? Well, it's not that they didn't want to follow him. It's that they didn't want to read your interest in. Don't squelch your interest. Check for the scripture. When you read in John, Andrew had actually been listening to John the Baptist. Right. And so this was the first time they had met Jesus. He didn't just pop up and say, oh, they had heard his teaching. They had seen him in both of them. So they had been in that cycle. If you read in Luke, the same account, you hear the account of Peter dropping down to Jesus and not to Jesus on the sins of Andrew. So there was a lot more backstory. There's a lot more going on in it. And it um, Kelly, like you're recommending Dallas Bullard. Uh, if anybody has not seen it, I would strongly recommend watch the shows. Right. <laughs> because they do an excellent job of saying, no, we can't be following Jesus. They're young people. They're like, yeah, we want to do something different. Okay, this guy's good. This guy's good. And so when he finally said, now's the time, we're going to start this mission, they're going to next. So it really wasn't, you know, oh, I'm just fishing today. Here comes a guy. He says, Join me and I do. They had already been there, like, oh, I'll tell you what, I got to earn a living and I'm a fisherman. He starts this ministry. The minute he says we're starting, we're done. We're going. Well, that's the testimony. If you, if you read prior, as we were talking about before we came in, this is Jesus' story. He's testifying, he's giving, he's teaching, and people are listening and it's fresh, like wildfire. Yeah. So it's not. He walks by, like you said, he yeah. walks by and can let go. They, they've been hearing it. It's been whispers, rumors, little things flying through. But still, the gut is known to say, We're under occupation. We're young men. We're supposed to be earning a living here. You think, like, No, you don't understand. This guy's worth it. This teacher is worth it. He says, We're going on the road. We're going on the road. I actually read it in my Bible. Like, I'm trying to put myself in the point of view of watching it happen, but if you give us an account of someone being there, their father is also watching it. It's not happening to him, he's watching it. And so like me pretending to watch it and him actually watching it, I can't pretend like as a parent, you want you you trained your child to do this thing. You're doing this thing with them. As a family, this is what you do. And this man comes past and calls them to do something else. And they say, yes, 
and they don't pull you in or bring you home first. They say yes, and they go, and they do the thing with him. And knowing that they're sad, are you proud that you have a plan? Are you, are you like, well, what about me? How come my sons were called and I was not? I was not called, and now, now I'm watching that someone else was called to do this thing over the thing that I have called them to do. They're just, I read it from the father. That's really and I think um, putting ourselves in the story, one of the things that's interesting to me about Jesus, the style of Jesus and the story and other stories too, is how relevant he is, that he's calling fishermen and he tells them, he uses their occupation to tell them what he wants to do with them. I'll make you fishers of men. Like if he had called me, he probably wouldn't have told me, I'll make you fishers of people because I just don't know how to fish. You know, I'm a stay at home parent. He might have said something like, I will help you love all the children of the world or something, you know, that would be relevant to me as a mom. Um, but I just think that's really interesting and beautiful how Jesus could look right at what was in front of them, him and them, I speak so directly to their situation. With this reality and vision, um, are you only putting yourself in the shoes of the person that was there, or could you just be like an observer? Well, in reality and vision, we'll, we'll be segueing there in just a moment. We're actually going, when we segue to reality and vision, we will move to our own very personal self. But when putting yourself in the story, you can do either. You can do, you can either be in their shoes or someone else's, mm -hmm. or um, we just didn't talk about imagining in current day what would have happened if that had happened in current day setting uh, does that answer your question Drew? oh uh yeah so you can be an observer you yeah can, you, you don't can have be an to observer. be in someone's shoes you don't have to be in someone's shoes yeah right. yeah uh, so let's segue now we're getting ready to go into the reality and vision part what I find really helpful to prepare for reality and vision is to do the teachings part of that. Um, and it gives you a nice place to start from. So I've got some questions on the screen. They're also in your blue sheet. But the teaching, you'll remember, is what does this tell me about God, who he is, what he does, and what does this tell me about people, humanity, myself, we are, who we should be. So you can answer any of those types of teachings. But you look at this short little text. What are some of the teachings that you see about God or humanity? I have one. I don't know if it's right. Uh, it's a theory I developed about this very thing, actually. Um, I think it's symbolic because because God didn't really, Jesus, I don't know if he needed disciples to do his ministry. Um, and so I think it was symbolic, or at least, and I could be wrong on it's just a theory. Um, I think it was his way. I think it was his way of telling us that we need to work together to accomplish tasks. It's, uh, this Jesus, the creator, the, well, the son of the creator of the universe, had 12 disciples during his ministry. So I don't know. It's just a theory. He probably didn't need to have a crew. Mm -hmm. But he, but he did. It was him showing us how how to do ministry. Beautiful, or at least one way. Yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, kind of uh, coming off of that, like to add to what you're saying, you would have expected Jesus to have chosen somebody in that way, or decided to be a rabbi, that was somebody that was going through the schooling and. You know, that would be at the temple and would be really committed to this whole. Wouldn't have expected him to go out and kill some fishermen. You know, and, and again, that's just a perfect picture to me. You know, God, we're all unable to God. It doesn't matter what our social economic state is, it doesn't matter what our race is, it doesn't matter, you know, whether we're influential people or just I know people. Yeah, God, we're all. Well, I think it's true too. If you're going to mold someone into what you want them to be, it's better to start with a mm -hmm. unburdened piece of clay, so to speak. 
where children are not as stressed. I mean, mm -hmm. day example, day example. I would rather teach someone who's never driven a bus to drive a bus mm -hmm. than a truck driver. Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. He's already got it in his head. And, and we joke about it because he is a truck driver and a train buster. And I think that's where God goes when she said she was young people. Because he could raise them up the way he wanted to, and he could put them where he wanted to go. And the reason why, I don't know if this is relevant, but the reason why is because I've probably, I'm 23 years with class ACL, I probably figure I don't. Absolutely, exactly. And the rabbis and everybody, even the rabbis and the and everybody that were there and earlier, they already had predisposed notions of how things were to be and the right way to get to God, and it had nothing to do with what Jesus was talking about. That's, I think that's why scripture not like here necessarily, but throughout scripture, we're invited and compelled to be childlike, and that's why it's you don't know what you don't know, and I don't know what I don't know. And, uh, to walk with humility and to recognize that we, it's beautiful that we don't know, we know everything. In First Corinthians, Paul says, and that he chose the lowly and the weak and those that were not. And I just love that phrase. Those, that, you know, it's like it's those, that's who we Jesus. This is the thing. Not just, yeah. not just a choosing, but that uh, boots on the ground. Uh, Rabbi back in that time would choose following you want to get it so they take I do two four times, but it's always that top down. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, if you learn, you learn from the rabbi. Oh, even better when the rabbi was on the Sanhedrin. It was this top down, top down initiative where they had heart to drop something as Jesus gets in the boat with these people and says, No, I'm not just going to teach you, and I'm not just picking this ragtag bunch of but I'm going to do this first. I am going. I am walking with you. I am going to teach you hands-on while we're doing this. This isn't going to be from a corporate office. Hallelujah! <laughs> Thank God! <laughs> Thank God! I would much rather have Jesus walking with me than having him telling me. Yes. <laughs> you know, I just come with me because this I can't do it by myself. I read this and I kind of was thinking about um, special calls whenever, whenever, wherever, even in the middle of your work day, he calls. Um, but also he calls the Father as well, and that's where, where I was really focused on today. Um, but he didn't call the Father to action, he called the Father to wait, to be patient, and to watch. And so he, it's not that the Father was forgotten or he wasn't chosen, but like he was just chosen to do something else. He had different plans for him. You know, and he's like, you've got these boys this far, and now it's time for me. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you know, kind of bring it in. So mm -hmm. that's really interesting, Destiny. And that's um, one of the things that struck me when I looked at this in the, the NASB, which is the verse on the right. Um, you see in verse 20, it says immediately, the NIV doesn't say it this way, but verse 20 says immediately, and then 22 says immediately again. So in both scenarios, so we are at 4 um, In both scenarios, you know, when the author uses the word twice, they're reinforcing. So to me, that was, Matthew was really speaking a strong teaching here, because while we can find in other texts that many people had probably had interactions with Jesus, Matthew wanted to tell us something really significant. I think that he used that word, you know, in these few short verses immediately and immediately. And I think this is <clears throat> definitely it's interesting to think about that in light of the father. The father had somebody had a different calling. It wasn't to get up and immediately go. To but immediately watch. Immediately say take care of the boat, but they did love the money. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but it's interesting for me to see that word and what the teaching that Matthew might be telling us. And I also think it's interesting in light of what we know about Matthew's own backstory, being an outcast and a tax collector and a betrayer of his own people, um, that this was what was so striking to him as someone who felt like an outcast about the way these guys responded, this immediacy of response. Yeah, well, so you hear about, and immediately he left blank and followed. Somebody else is telling the story about Matthew. Mm -hmm. 
they said he went by a collector whose name was Levi and God said, Follow him. And he immediately left his group yeah. and followed. So that's the same thing. I wish I could immediately follow that. There are times when I do, but usually it's like, Okay, God, what's going on? What are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you doing? Okay, just trust me. Let's go through this whole thing. Yeah. And I go, Okay. <laughs> Let's um let's kind of use that um, observation that Kim is made to springboard into the reality of the vision. So um so you guys kind of get the feel of how we do the T of tax. And well, first we started with putting ourselves in the story. I always think that's a big thing the chart. So we're gonna pick a teaching and we're gonna pick this one that we were just talking about. And I like what you said, Kim. You brought out kind of the angst of that, that like it seems like Matthew's trying to talk to us about that, and it feels a little like uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Like we feel some discomfort because we know that's not where we naturally go every time. So, um, so I'm gonna uh, put the teaching in here for us, and that is, um, how would we say that? Immediately follow God is what you're talking about. Yep. Okay. Questions asked. Yeah, they just did it. They didn't just say maybe or I'll get there in a second. Let me think about the. They just they just went. Yeah. So that's what you said. Well, I wish I could follow them like this, but I do the same thing. If I want to follow you, but no, first I got a back and I got to move her. Just like distraction. Yeah. I wanted to do it in the study. Yeah, I want to do this. I really want to focus on this, but you know, can't take too bad. I need to go under and I need to do And it's petty. It's fine. Yeah. To do it, to not just sit. So I'm I'm going to go back to the I'm right on what Ann said. I'm, I'm shifting us into the reality side of reality and vision. So reality says, so we've got a teaching or a truth that we're looking at, which is I, I don't know what verb you want to put in there. I've got, I immediately follow God. I can, I should, I want to. Um, but I, but I immediately follow God. So let's look at, we're looking at the reality. When this is not true in my life, what does this look like? So you're getting very specific now. And you can look at, you just described actual behavior. You know, I, kind of feed the, I need to feed the cat. And the distractions come up. And I realize I haven't changed a load of laundry. So, so there's all of the behaviors. And so you can look at behaviors. That's a great example of behaviors. You can look at thoughts, attitudes, emotions, beliefs. Pretty much you're looking at the whole package. The reality is this is not true in my life when I do not immediately follow God. So you're just trying to get honest with yourself about what does life look like for you when you don't do that? How does that play out? Can, so, I, ask, can I ask a question before we yeah. talk about it? Um, it is, does, are we always called to drop everything? Oh, I, is that, that's my question. Uh -huh. Is, are, is that always is everyone always called immediately drop everything to follow? Or or because there in the, in this scripture there were specific people that he asked he yeah. like he just mentioned that was not, not called yeah. to drop everything. Yeah. Follow. So yeah. so is everyone always that's the question. So I think always, it would be if Jesus is asking you to do something, then I think the immediate immediacy is important. But Zebedee was being asked to do something very different. Mm -hmm. And he followed that immediately too. He didn't right. get out of the boat and say, wait for me, guys. Tom, I'm gonna be, you know, with you guys. Right. He had a, a sense of immediacy, even though his immediacy was actually Sorry. inactive. So right, this yeah. is my question. This is my question right here. Um, so he Zebedee wasn't called to drop everything and follow. He was called to take care of the boat. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So in other words, okay. that's the question. I'm asking. I think so that I think, answers. Yeah. yeah, immediately depends on what it is. Are Sorry. you called to immediately wait to see what God has for you? Or are you exactly. called to immediately go to Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. okay. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It's both. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Immediately this. Wait on this. Yeah. What I think it is, is if you're feeling a prompting from God to do something, He really should be calling us first, and you put it on, you put it off. Yeah. That's not immediate. Yeah. And I you think know? listening also is an immediate thing. You might not be acting immediately, but just listening to, to God, that already is. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. My, my brain kind of has a response to your question when you asked, it. like maybe we're immediately invited to listen. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. comes next? Yeah, it's always 
in that moment, I'm gonna pull my truck over. Yeah, I've got kept in that. What he called to start the whole thing, we called the nation of Israel, he called Abraham and said, I'm going to get a great nation with you. I'm going to give you kids even though you don't have one. And it was another 10 years, 12 years. So I'm calling you something, and you're going to wait a while. <laughs> okay. Most it sounds like I'm calling you. Yeah. Yeah. Does that feel that's a great clarification? So the action that he may be calling you to immediately, it may be an action, it may be holding your tongue or listening or waiting to ask him until the timing comes. But there's still a sense of immediacy, even if it's not an active immediacy. It's whatever it is he's calling, you know, whatever you feel like he's asking you to do. But that's so maybe the, the immediacy is just pay attention to me. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to talk to you about something. Can you stop long enough to pay attention to me? Yep. <laughs> yep. Whether it's to do something or just, you know, right. or learn something. Yeah. All right. All right. Wait, I think that is one of the things that came out of Rita too, but stop talking. <laughs> stop talking, which I'm really not good at because I'm not. Um, but no, stop talking and listen. That's good. So going keeping that in mind, that kind of broader framing, let's go back to the reality. When this truth is not true, if you don't pay attention to him, when you don't respond immediately to what he's asking you to do, what does that look like in your life? How does that play out? Uh, with thoughts, attitudes, emotions, behaviors, beliefs. Well, I believe that when we don't, you know, stop or we don't listen or, you know, we don't do what we're called to do, I feel that that leads to, like, uh, the devil just coming in and, you know, just putting thoughts in your head or, like, just things that you're not, yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. well, I guess that's what I feel sometimes, you know. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, give them a, a way in, you know. Did you say doubt? Was that the word? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, when God is calling us to do something, there's a blessing. He has a blessing lined up for us. If we follow yeah. what he's calling us to do, we miss out on the blessing if we don't immediately respond. Mm -hmm. So is the, if, if it's an action to do something for someone, they would miss out on the blessing as well. So, yeah, it could be us and them. Shorting yourself and someone else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you go, Larry. Um, I was just thinking about a situation this week for me with this, where God was calling me to do something, and I kept. <laughs> I I don't know. This is too hard enough to do with this, so I'm, I'm I just kept pushing it off. I heard about a, a good friend who's been having some health struggles and. Up to May, I went through a bunch of testing and just got a really horrible diagnosis. I mean, he's got a deadly disease for which there's no treatment. And God, and he sent me some, some information about the disease that he wanted me to look at. And I did look at that, and then I was like blown away by that. And I was like, how do you deal with this? And I had no idea what to say to him or how to reach out to him. And so I just kept putting it off. God kept promising me. You know, he sent this to you. You're a good friend. If you want to respond, you need to respond to him. And I'm like, what do I say? I don't. I'm not right now. I don't know if I should this. I got this one. You know. And and finally this morning I did do it. Did respond back to him. But it was like I put it off for a couple of days, and I could feel God come to me like, you need to. This guy just bared his soul to you. You need to reach out to him. You know. Just like this is. Ugly and hard and nasty, and I don't know what to do with this. You know, I mean, what God wanted me to do is stop and say, Don't stink to him and say, You gotta help me because I don't. Mm -hmm. you know, but I, I, so instead of doing the I just put it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so putting it off. And Larry, when you look at that, do you see anything as a result of putting it off? Do you see anything in, ter in terms of the thoughts or the attitudes or the emotions that were going in you in that interim? You were putting it off until the moment of... Yeah, lots of guilt. <laughs> lots, mm -hmm. lots of... Um, this, is, this is not good what you're doing. Just, mm -hmm. you know, you're thinking about yourself and not your brain. Yeah. Right. Right. I think one of the things that I experience when I don't respond with immediacy is um, 
I guess I would say my conscience gets more seared and that I reinforce with myself the belief that what I think I want to need to do today is more important than what God wants me to do today. And every time I make that choice, I reinforce that lie in my own head. Um, and, and every time I reinforce that lie, I elevate my own ego and my own effort, and I diminish in my own mind the value of God and the action in my life. So, um, so I'm making a God of myself, and I'm diminishing the true God. Yeah. What did you say? Idols. Yeah, making an idol. Making an idol of whatever you want to do. I use that a lot. Yeah. I tell people, oh, I believe in God. Yeah. I believe in God and he knows my heart that's good enough. Yeah, yeah okay. It's not, it's not good enough. Yeah. You know, I, I put my stuff in front of his stuff. Those are my idols. Those are my dead yeah. figures. When I do that, I get overwhelmed. And then I feel alone because I shut the door on God. <laughs> and he doesn't work. And I shut it myself. And what Chris saying, especially about uh, you know, if you leave the opening statement, we'll take advantage of it. Yeah. But remember, if you can do the work for him, he's, he's a creature of limited resources. If you do the work for him, he he's not going to waste any more time. So one of the openings is get distracted. Yeah. Oh, but I got the jets. And then, like you said, then that that thing you say, I got to do this instead, sears the consciousness, doubles the senses, and all of a sudden. A quick interruption becomes a habit. And then if you're in the habit, then later on you say, I really got to get back to my scripture study. Oh, I'm going to be so much work on I've been gone from it for so long. That's so true. And, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm not actually doing both. You know, and so it doesn't, you know, beyond the garden, it doesn't have to be some big, massive temptation or big, massive distraction. It can just be really something subtle that can just get you out of the wrong cycle. You're doing the work more. <laughs> like leaving your bag next to the computer for just going to work on the computer every night. Yeah. And then the bag goes, no, excuse me. I love it. Yeah. Just keep pulling me out and not looking at the computer. Well, pulling me out. <laughs> and it does. I swear it talks. <laughs> and I go in and I sit down and I go, okay. You know, and it's it's very, that's why I said this. I like, yeah, because the bag goes, yeah. yeah. Isn't it interesting how I really like the way that the way that we're unpacking this? It starts to bring clarity on things that are easy to miss when you're in the daily routine of making choices, and how a small choice leads to another small choice. You know, I mean, it's not very cliche, but it's very real how uh, the choices lead to isolation from God, and they lead to isolation from each other. Um, it's just crazy. And uh, one of you guys just said, it doesn't have to be a magic. It can be a very small, you know, two pieces of laundry or whatever. And I'm not trying to guilt us, but nevertheless, sometimes when we don't look at what's really happening in our life, that it takes, it has this energy of its own, which has a very spiritual energy to it. And it's happening. We can choose not to look at it, but it's happening, you know? So, um, so yeah, anything else will bring you to the vision side? Oh, I wanted to say just a, a note of, um, of practicality. When I'm doing reality and vision, I really like to draw a line down my journaling space and do reality on one side and then do vision right beside it. You don't have to, if your space doesn't lend to that, you can do reality and vision next. But, um, but you have kind of got the two, two columns set up like that. But anyone else have something that is that you know it's kind of burning on your time that you want to get out about reality. I was just gonna say I justify sharing my time with God and my chores. Anybody else? Yeah. Tell us more about that, Anne. I want to hear what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I can do laundry and still worship God, right? Yeah. And I can go put a load in and I can go read. Yeah. And then I can go back and fridge it and I can go back and go read. Yeah. And instead of pulling myself away from the laundry mm -hmm. and just spending time with God, I I go, okay, you'll understand, you know, I gotta get this done. Yeah. And, and then I get mad at myself, my conscience. Yeah. Why are you forcing God to wait for you to do the water? Yeah. Even the yeah. five minutes it takes you to switch the load. Yeah. yeah. That sounds silly. Yeah. That's no. silly. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's just being I efficient. Think personal. <laughs> I think the personal thing that you're saying, John, is what's very important to you being 
brought it to your attention. Yeah, right. right. You pay yeah. attention to. Yeah. So right. For me, I look at it, if I did something, I'm getting it scratched on the way that I want to focus. Yeah. Otherwise, I can't be focused. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's a really good point, Terry. It's an issue of conscience. So if your conscience feels like, this is my opinion, if your conscience feels like this is not how God wants to approach him, then you've got to, then you need to respond to that. That's the responsiveness. But, you know, if for someone else, if they feel, they may feel just the opposite. And um, that sort of fuzzy, amorphous kind of feeling that like it may be one way for one person and completely different for another is a little hard for us. But I really think that, um, you know, it's responding where you think he wants you. Yeah. Um, all right, let's shift. And now we're going to completely shift. We've kind of looked at the reality of life and how what happens when we're living out the reality of not being responsive to what we think Jesus is asking us to do in his teaching or in his calling, but he literally called them out of the boat. Now we're going to shift to vision. The vision side is when you look at what if this teaching, the teaching being that I immediately follow God and I pay attention to what he's saying. What if this teaching were explosively true in my life? In other words, it's completely pervasive. It's radically true. We're not talking about an incremental change. We're talking about this completely defined reality. And I understand that growth is incremental, <laughs> so we're not saying that, that this is going to happen today. But we are saying there's a lot of value in my mind to having a vision for the life that Jesus is calling you into. That you know if you keep stepping where you're going to end is going to be amazing. And it's hard to be, in my mind, it's also hard to be motivated towards something. You never can think about what that's going to look like. Like, why would you want to go there if you never? kind of, you know, daydream about it or fantasize about it, or I mean that in a good way, you know, but um, so now you're going to take the ceiling off of limitations because we do have the power of the universe on our side. What would life look like? Same thing, thoughts, attitudes, emotions, behaviors, beliefs. If it were explosively true that I immediately follow God and I immediately pay attention to him, and he's speaking to me. I have this answer perfectly because I've I, it, I've given I have not Sharon has talked to me so much about being in this, and now that I'm here mm -hmm. in this simple, I'm like my vision is I'm going to get closer to God. That's the way I feel. You know, somehow by by ignoring the word, I'm going to grow. But I didn't take this. But my excuse has always been, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm not too busy. You know, but I just kept turning this over to God and said, God, if you want me to do this, you're going to enable me somehow. So bring the power, yeah. And one thing he did is spoke to her and, and she talked me off the cliff, remember? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sharon was like, Kim, Kim, just slow down. <laughs> so good. But, you know. But yeah, that's a beautiful thing when you finally um, release something. And not everything is for everybody. There's a time for everything. Maybe that wasn't my time. Right. But, you know, you do release something, it's a good feeling. And I mean, it's hard not feeling. But. But, but the feelings that they're, you know, I mean, our feelings usually do follow our thoughts and our beliefs. Yeah. So they're not our masters, but they do usually follow our thoughts and beliefs. So at some point, our feelings will probably be an indicator of what's happening in our thoughts and beliefs. And at the end there, you use the word reason. I'm going to add that too. Who else has a thought on what this might look like? Your thoughts, your attitudes, your emotions, your behaviors. Um, I think about actually this semester has been just crazy hurricane. Um, but when I think about vision and future, um, even amidst all of that, you know, when I talk about the best parts of my life, um, over the semester, there was really bad problems with racism on campus. And immediately, immediately, I was, I felt like I was like, I need to go sit in the lounge, I need to go tell them. Um, and so I tried to that. And with that, I was able to they created a job specifically so that I could immediately fight this fight and I could come and support my fellow students, like my peers and classmates. And both of my project proposals are immediately, like come January 4th, my projects are underway. This is happening. 
Um, and same thing outside of that, young adult ministry, fine arts ministry, immediately, the minute that it was, I prayed about it in the auditorium and after that, after leaving the auditorium, immediately I found Frank and we got full rolling. These were like, I'm not living it now, but I'm preparing to live in it. If that happens, but also I am living in it now because I immediately was able to respond. It's just you immediately respond so that you can immediately wait. And that's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Something about immediate response that gives you peace. You know, mm. I'm not arguing with myself. I'm not. You know, trying to distract myself but not dealing with you know the guilt of you know because i'm not mm -hmm. <laughs> the peacefulness yeah that's more yeah. good yeah i gotta follow an old art school rule one of the lessons that was taught that really sunk in is you're creating a piece when you're creating something anything goes creatively anything goes as long as it works <laughs> so like, but anything you want to put into the piece works as long as it, as long as it works, as long as it contributes to what your vision is for the final piece. So if you there's a certain color you really love, but it doesn't work what the landscape or the background of whatever you want to show, you ditch it. You don't use it. It doesn't work. It's maybe a great color, but it doesn't work in a scenario. So to respond immediately, if God gives you a vision, it's it's comfort. And it's it's relaxing, it frees the mind because then there's a whole lot of stuff you can see to go, no, that doesn't fit where God's taking you right now. You know, it, it may be great to uh, start another Bible study group, but right now we have a mix, it wouldn't fit. Okay, drop it. You know, it, 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 it might be one of like, but it doesn't fit where God's giving me the vision, drop it. And then all of a sudden your schedule is so cluttered. <laughs> I'm looking at that vision of what he wants me to do. I'm doing what he wants me to do. That's good. I think of um, one of the things, if I imagine this explosively true in my life, is the sense of his strength in the challenges. Um, I'm thinking now about getting to, ready to go into the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the most dense, rich, hands on teaching of the Bible about how to approach life. And so hopefully we'll be getting a lot of these kind of get out of your boat instructions from him, you know, as he deals with anger and lust and um, greed and worry, all of the things that are so challenging, uh, you know, and they're the things that are tough. They're tough things in life. That's why he teaches on them. But, but I think part of what my vision is that even though they're tough things, that it's going to be his strength that's flowing through us as we respond to what he's teaching us. And uh, and that I, it's a little hard to put first, but I feel like the time that I have leaned into an immediate response in a tough situation, you know, there's kind of nervousness maybe going into it, but on the other side, this sense of like, Knowing that Jesus gave you the strength and that Jesus led you through the responding to that teaching. I don't know what the word is for it. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to put words around. Um, there's something about his power in that, I guess. Also, experiencing his power in the response. There's something I want to hand, but I just don't know how to word it. Okay, do you want to try? I don't know if it's relevant. Um, um, <clears throat> in my case, it's I don't know if it's a call to action as much as it is a call to learn. Um, and so when I respond, uh, it, it's amazing how all of a sudden people who can teach suddenly start popping up mm -hmm. in my life. I think that's where I'm at in yeah. my life is I'm just trying to learn right now. Yeah. And it sounds like your your um, 
sensitive to how Jesus is putting those resources in your life, the yeah. people or the whatever you're finding the teaching that he's putting those there and that you're just kind of that sense of readiness for that. Yeah. And openness to those things. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Yeah. Also sounds like he's validating. Yeah. yeah. Like you're just like you're like, okay, I'm gonna to respond to this. He's validating, yes, this is I'm putting the people now into your life to prove to you that, or to show you you're you're in the right you're going the right way. Cool. Yeah. And the big term is grace. Mm -hmm. This is grace. Mm -hmm. You trust I will provide it. My grace will be sufficient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of my favorite teachers um, talks about the idea of doing versus being, mm -hmm. and that we get the order wrong all the time. We want to go out and do a lot of doing, but we don't just act being in the presence of God and learning, learning that sitting in this being and learning, and learning from other people who are farther along in the journey than we are. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so part of the vision. And I think it's easy to jump into the to doing. Even my example was the doing of um, going back to this gentleman who's a good friend. But I needed before I could do that, doing peace to be with God. I needed mean, just the, the the problem was that it felt too hard for me. It felt too painful, and so I kept putting it off. So the pro the solution to that is to just go do it, just to get it off the plate and say, okay, I did it. I'm giving you a little body. You know, it's like I needed to sit down with God and say, I have no idea how to do this. And this is way too hard. It's painful. And I don't really want it. But so to be first and then to then hear him say, it's okay. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. We don't just dive headlong in our own strength. Right. Mm -hmm. In our own humanity, mm -hmm. which is completely finite. First, you come to God and just let him in and talk to him about the confusion, frustration, stress, difficulty. Mm -hmm. Let him guide that. That's really good. I think, too, another thing is the vision that I have of immediately listening. And Larry, that's interesting. That goes back to what you said a few minutes ago when we were kind of wrestling around the I immediately follow him. What you said was that I pay attention to him. Mm -hmm. How those are linked again to what you said. But I think about when I immediately pay attention to listen to God and respond to God, that it takes off some of the, well, I think uh, I need to go explosively true. If this were explosively true, I think it would take off the burden that I put on myself. You know? I've got my list of things to do today. I've got these things I need to accomplish. I got you know, kind of like the handbook thing, all these distractions, all these things that need to be done. But as I imagine myself becoming more open to him in every moment and every thought, paying attention to that, then the burden that I put on myself is becomes almost insignificant, I would think, because I'm just is it responding to him. And he'll take care of what needs to get done and what I thought needed to be get done, maybe this is going to So, uh, yeah. If I could add, like, I'm hearing all of you as actively as I can and I'm listening. And then I'm also sort of having this side road thought in my mind that says when I slow down or when I immediately slow down to listen to God and what He has to say. I find that I end up, um, how do I put this in the world? I find that I end up almost uh, absorbing a little bit more of his words and character than my own in a very humble way. So it's that, it's that concept of, um, you know, I think most of us have heard the idea of it becomes most like the five people you spend most time with, right? Or that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong brain. Like you need to slow down, humble up, learn, grow, pause, all these buzzwords, I suppose. But if I spend time with God and I listen to what he has to say, he doesn't judge me and my stress. So why would I judge you and yours? And when I slow down and God gives me grace, he's giving me grace, I can give you grace. Like it's, he's showing me 
how to show up in life. Making good. Making good. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been. Yeah. You know, because that's what he wants to do, wants us to be a channel. You know, right, exactly. And that the more time to spend with them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's never a. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think to me that just brings me to uh, First Corinthians 11 1 is God says, Be imitators of me as I am Christ. And that's kind that's of right. you know, you're imitating yeah. them. So now we're going to, um, as we're closing out on reality and vision, I'd like to then pause and just step back and look at the two columns that I've made. Um, and again, I'm making this sound sort of almost clinical. You know, you put these columns and you wouldn't need columns. You know what I mean? You just you had your mind in the space of what reality is. You let your mind start to imagine what he might have for you. So uh, it's really intended to get you into more of a spiritual experience, not a virtue experience, but um, just to let yourself notice what happens when you look at that comparison. And, and there's not a right answer here. You might feel like totally energized, like I want this future. You might feel like, oh my goodness, why have I been living here? What's going on with me? And, you know, um, and so just it's kind of just having that conversation with them as you're looking at the three sides of the reality and the vision. So as you look at our reality and our vision today, what is your reaction when you compare those and you look at those two? I feel like I want to give myself more grace mm -hmm. because as others have, you know, sometimes you think you're the only one that is obedient and doesn't do things. And you know that's not true, but it's so nice to hear that the struggle is universal. Um, and it's like you know what? Yeah, I don't know. It just it just give myself grace. It's okay. Try again. Every day's a new day. You know, and just keep trying because the vision is so awesome. Yeah, it's worth it. It's worth it. <clears throat> we were talking before we came in here about it, and she just said, you know, being more Christ-like. If you read the chapters that we've read so far, he's baptized, then he's tempted. Mm -hmm. And then he tests. He testifies. He preaches. He testifies, and then he chooses his disciples. So where are you in that journey in becoming Christ-like? And when we're baptized, we we're reborn, and then we're tested. So to me, like for me, you say, where does that vision take us? He's testing me right now to to be hard. Be ready to give my story to move forward and be take, share my discipleship, become a disciple, and do what he wants me. Yeah. Are you going to feel like he's pulling you forward? He, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, ever since I started from my baptism on, you know, and 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 that's what I was getting at is that she was saying, you know, become more Christ like, give ourselves more grace. And if you watch anyone I talked about it, how much do you know in advance versus. How much did Jesus know about his life where it was going to go? Yeah. It's just that's where I feel like he's pushing me is towards my discipleship to get out there and be that person. Yeah. Yeah. It almost feels like a path. When you look at your reality and you look at the vision, it's like you can just see he's got a path ahead of you, which is really helpful. Anyone else have a last comment on comparison? I mean, the only word that comes to mind would be more focused, you know, of this remaining focused on him and what he's calling us to do, you know, yeah. um, either to be in, in a deeper relationship with him yeah. or to be, if you, if you are ready, you know, just to invite others to have mm -hmm. that same relationship. Mm -hmm. I would also know the idea of giving ourselves more grace, which is the most difficult thing to attempt, but living in that reality, the isolation, the distraction, the procrastination, the the fear, the doubt, and that I'm assuming that even though the vision sounds nice, looks nice, even on the days we're winning, we will be fearful of it ending or doing it wrong, doubtful of, you know, having losing it, scared to, you know, isolating that fear, not wanting to vocalize it. I'm sure that even in the vision, these things will still be a reality and just to give ourselves that, that grace to allow reality to be part of the vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's right. So that, that tension can coexist. So this is where we are. Mm -hmm. The vision is amazing, but we can coexist with the reality and really I was just sitting here kind of thinking the same thing. Like the vision sounds really great, but it seems like it's really hard to get to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems so far away and it seems so hard to, to reach. It's almost like you're the one started this journey here. <laughs> well, it's not as if when you arrive, these things go away. It's like um, as you pick things up, you don't drop the thermal where you have to be hold it all, go full past. You don't leave your path to be your vision. The things that got you there probably will stay a part of your story. We're not going to erase or delete it. So the idea of being able to give ourselves more grace with that. And I think that the vision, it, it, the closer we can come to articulating the true vision is going to be describing what heaven will be. Because it'll be complete union with God. But I don't think that God sent for heaven to be after we die. I mean, it is. I mean, I do. <laughs> but I don't think it's only that. I think also intended us to be approaching heaven on earth. Each step as we get closer and closer, heaven comes to us on earth because we're approaching union with God. So, um, so yeah, it 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 it, it does. It is a, a difficult of distance, but it's a beautiful it's something that has opportunity to actually look forward to aging. As I think about how much Jesus changed me in the last year. Forget, you know, what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years, you know, it is like heaven is coming into earth and it's, it's a journey, but it's an amazing journey. And the destination is home, the complete unity with God. Um, and the thing about, I think, the, the grace and, and when we struggle and when we're going to miss the mark is that the more that we can wrap our minds around how much grace there is for that mm -hmm. rather than like it making us like well I don't have it you know I'm not grace perfectly it doesn't it, that grace is what both of us want to live in that reality or that vision you know be, it's it's not a burden that I've got to be striving so I can get yeah. to the vision. Yeah. But each time I fall there's so much grace so I want to trust him more. I want to listen to him more. I want to be present because he's nobody else can give me that kind of grace. Okay. I think that's a really good point just to close on is that as we look forward to this vision and as we kind of surrender ourselves to his power in that, but ultimately, it's his work and his power in us. It's not going to be from our own striving. And that as you are facing that next step, that it's just a prayer of help me, Jesus. It's going to be done in his power coming through you, not not in your human strength. Uh, it's one of those weird dichotomies. Like it takes every ounce of your human strength, and your human strength is yet completely uh, insufficient. Um, and, it's, and it's every ounce of of power ultimately comes from him and is a gift to us. So, um, oh, 236. So it is time for us to close out the prayer after we're done. If you want to kind of um, connect briefly with your groups, you can. I think we're mostly arranged in groups. Um, briefly, you're over to by us. But, uh, but yeah, if you want to take a moment of your prayer request, or just want to say hi to each other, um, that would be great. But let's just take this moment to pray. Jesus, we just want to say thank you for the way that you, when we read this story, how you call those guys right out of their boats and right out of their work, and you gave them a life that was so much bigger and unimaginably, we just can't even imagine the life. Um, so we do pray that you will give us that vision of the life with you, that what a perfect union with you would look like, that we know we can't understand that perfectly, but we pray that it will be our inspiration and our love for you and our desire to be with you. And Jesus, we ask you to help us in this. We completely rely on your strength, not on our own strength. And every time that we want to take a step towards you, we pray that we will invite you to take that step with us and for us and in us, and that it will be done through your strength, that we will not try to claim that on our own. 
And we just want to praise you, Jesus, for the beauty of your future with us and for the joy of being with people who love you together. Jesus, we pray all of this in your name and power. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Did you guys hook up out? Yeah, we